hello and welcome to our special panel conversation today. Uh, don't return to normal, return to better. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host for the, the afternoon. Just two quick notes before I turn things over to our panel facilitator. The session is part of our rapid response webinar series. You can find future as well as past webinars in this series by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash online. Second, uh, today's session is being recorded, so you'll receive an email within about an hour after this session ends with a link to the recording. And please do share this with others in your organization. So for now, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, each of them is an accomplished author and coach. For expediency, uh, I'll share links after our session is finished so that you can learn more about the facilitators. Uh, but for now, let me please welcome who you see on the screen here, uh, Jamie Flinchball, Karen Martin, David Veach, hey. and our facilitator, uh, Jim Hunsinger. So thanks so much panel for being here. And Jim, I'll go ahead and turn things over to you. All right, thank you, Dwayne, and uh, thank you, panel, and thank you everybody for joining us. Just one thing I'm gonna, I wanna jump into, uh, jump into what we're gonna do here pretty quick, but one thing I wanted to mention to kind of kick this off was the name, the name of this uh, session is Dwayne um, referred to is Don't Return to Normal, Return to Better. And it actually started off with a conversation we were having not that many days ago with David, and he happened to mention that. And in, in the context of that, we thought that's a great point and a great thing to think about and even better, be better to discuss about it. So we said, okay, well, let's get together a group of people that can talk towards that. And that's what got us here just a few days later with this panel. So we're excited about that. And before we get to the questions, and one thing I will say about the questions is we asked for people to send in questions and we got a, a, a lot of questions. So thank you very much for all your contributions. We will not be able to get to all of them, but we're gonna to try to get to as many as we can. We tried to group some together to some degree because where some were related just to try to uh, help in answering the question as well. But before we get going, we're just gonna have uh, go through each of our panelists and let them kind of give some opening comments. And of course, ladies first, we'll start with Karen. Thanks, Jim. Well, hi, everyone. You know, these are definitely challenging times, but what I love about what's happening right now, the silver lining, as it were, um, that, that we're experiencing is the proof that in human species is a very resilient and a very adaptive species. And I mean, we've moved so fast um, and pivoted so um, dramatically in many ways, and yet we're all still here. Well, not you know, I mean, those of us who are fortunate are still here. That's a horrible situation for many people. But for those of us that are able to work from our homes and continue to do something um, to help serve customers, which is what we're all in business to do, um, it just goes to show how much we are able to innovate quickly. And I think the key is to figure out what do we do after this crisis has passed somewhat to keep those muscles toned and get them even stronger and more flexibility built into our organizational bodies and our personal bodies as well. So um, it's a great living lab that we're living in right now, great time to experiment and to just really reflect every day about what you've accomplished that you would otherwise not have even tried. That's my, right. that's my thought. All right, thank you, Karen. And uh, next we'll have uh, Jamie give his opening comments. Great, thank you. Um, uh, two two themes that I I've been focusing on with a lot of my coaching, uh, some of which is with entrepreneurs and business owners, some you know specialists and executives. It's really two things that apply, I think, to both individuals and to companies. One is in a in a period where we feel like there's so much that we can't control, it is focus on the controllables. Find whatever it is that you can control and really knock the hell out of it, right? Really, I don't care if the only thing you control is your posture during a, during a meeting, then that's what you focus on. So however big or small, you find your controllables, you focus on those, you make the most out of those since there are so many things you can't control. But the second thing is really to double down on strengths. And again, organizationally or personally, if, if you're, um, 
if your strength is about relations or loving or it's about waste donation or it's about strategy, just double down on what you're best at and make the most out of that as a focal point. Um, you know, some people will do better than others and some people will be able to help more than others. But, but ultimately, if we leverage our strengths and really focus on how those become the shift and the focus, I think we can do a whole lot more during this period. All right, thank you, Jamie. And then uh, David. Hi, everyone. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Um, what, what comes to my mind is just when we, we have talked about introducing change as lean change agents for decades, right? And we all know that change is difficult because people start in this comfort zone and it, people really resist getting out of that comfort zone because they're afraid of what the new is going to look like. Um, there are thousands of people who've been work, working remotely for years. This is not a new thing for a lot of people. But for all of those who are now out of their comfort zone, trying to figure out what to do in this new situation, I think that's where we've got some real opportunity to explore. And so that's, that's what hit me is we have time now. Some of us are really busy, some of us are not at all busy, but all of us have gotten past that resistance now and we've accepted that this is the way we're going forward. We're gonna be stuck here for at least a little while. We gotta figure out how to get as much done as we can. And so we're innovating, we're creating these new ways to work. And if we don't take the time to capture the new stuff that we're doing and think about it and think about putting these in place permanently, we're just going to go back to normal. And I'm telling you, that's going to be going back. And we don't want to go back. we got to go forward. So if we focus on what we're doing differently, focus on what's working now, what can we do better when we get back so we return to better instead? And that's where I want to kind of focus this conversation. I think you guys have some great things to share. We've got some great questions and I'm ready to dive in. Okay. Thank you, David. And with that, well, what we did putting these together into questions, like I said, we got a ton of questions is we had kind of talked several times about just what's going on as a, as a group, as we were setting this up. And then also we took a look at the questions and we, to the best of our ability, kind of tried to categorize it to some degree with th three categories. So we're going to kind of walk through questions we think that kind of correlate as we went through the questions of these. And the first one is kind of around the attitude and mindset. So with that, um, the first question somebody asked was around the uh, what psychology considerations, you know, are there in supporting a team to seize this particular opportunity to, to uh, return to the better in that case? So any, any one of you want to jump in and just start the discussion? Sure. For teams, what we're having to do now is be much more mindful about how we're communicating with our people. Where we used to be able to just kind of wander around the office or wander out on the shop floor, now we can't do that. So we have to be very mindful, very intentional about going out and connecting with people on our teams. Uh, a lot of folks are struggling with how to huddle in this new environment, but a lot of folks, like I said, are learning these new ways to stay connected and deliberately um, make progress as a team while they're working remote. Some would say, I would, I would imagine that some would say uh, they're communicating better now because they have to go about it intentionally and more mindfully. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add, um, you know, at first, uh, maybe a, a big picture note around what companies need to be thinking about and team leaders need to be thinking about is, you know, the, the next wave that we have to worry about is a mental health uh, uh, set of issues. And I, I think we need to be very aware of what people are struggling with, uh, family members that are sick, family members that are laid off. Uh, and, and so, you know, really being mindful that the, the stresses that people are experiencing are being experienced in very different ways and very acute ways so I think there's just needs to be some some mindfulness and even company programs to help help deal with that. Um, the second thing, is, as David said, I, I think a lot of people are communicating more intentionally. They're putting more thought because the social contract of how meetings used to be run was broken. We need to reform them. We don't want to. You know, I don't think people want to go back to work, put on a mask, sit in a large group meeting, and watch you know 100 PowerPoint pages. Like they're going to be pissed off if that's their experience. So, you know, keep that thought going about structuring and 
purposeful communication, whether in meetings or anything else. Um, another question somebody had was they, or actually several people kind of alluded to this. They feel like that people have been a bit, you know, in this in the last month and a half or so, a bit passive and not quite sure um, who they should trust. A lot of information that's came out is changed, almost kind of changes on a daily basis, to some degree, but certainly changed. But they kind of asked the question in that environment: how how can they, or how can we, or how should we show up differently with that circumstance? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so clarity first is a, a theme that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think that the, um, you can, there's to Jamie's point in the beginning, there's what you can control, there's what you can't control. And what you can control is how you're communicating and you can control when you're receiving an informa information, whether or not it's clear enough to know, pre you know precisely what to do with that information. And so I think that's, that's something to, to think about. Um, in terms of the mixed messages and the, um, you know, the confusion that we hear from the outside, you know, we can't necessarily, you know, go to Washington and say, what do you mean by that? Um, but we can ask our bosses and our superiors and our colleagues and our teams, what do they mean by something? And, and that helps quite a bit in, in this kind of, you know, uncertain and somewhat ambiguous environment. We can actually control ambiguity to a large extent. We can't necessarily control the uncertainty. No, you're right, you're right, Karen. I think uh, uh, one of the things we've got to keep in mind is is we need to we need to take this opportunity to teach folks how to think a little bit more critically and how to ask more questions so they can get to that clarity. So ask questions of your leaders, and leaders ask questions of your people so we can get more clarity on what our internal expectations are. The world is gonna happen, the world is gonna go on. How are we gonna control what affects us? How are we gonna communicate? How are we gonna to work together going forward? Yeah, can I add one thing to that, David? Uh, that's Please. a great point. And one of the things that I have found over the years is just a very powerful uh, technique to use is asking questions about questions. So in other words, when someone asks you a question, there's very often something behind that that they're not necessarily articulating. And by asking them to, un to explain a little bit about why they're asking that question, you know, in a very kind and loving and gentle way, you often learn that you had no idea what they were actually asking until you asked the question about the question. So that's just something, a little trick that um, I picked up somewhere along the way that has been super powerful. Yeah, that's very cool. We we are very good at making assumptions, <laughs> yes, and so we got to get feel past those assumptions. And yeah. speaking of assumptions, just to add one little note because this is an important question. You know, leaders and organizations again, they can only control their organizational uh, culture, and and trust is going to be a really important thing, especially uh, as people understand all the circumstances. We've had companies where uh, people have said, well, if if someone that works next to me is infected, they, they will tell me, right? Um, just wondering if they will or won't. So, so this idea of trust becomes important. I, I won't go through it, but I've been writing and speaking a lot on what I call the four C's of trust. But the, the two things that I think are most important are the demonstrating care, right? Which is part of what we've already, already talked about, but also the communication around, um, uh, you know, putting that empathy and putting that care into the communication but not just communicating more frequently, but much more transparently. And that includes saying, here's the things we don't know yet, right? Just here's the things we do know, here's the things we don't know. Don't let people fill the void and say, what, what aren't they telling us? Just be as, be as transparent as you can, because it's, you know, people need that in order to, to trust what's behind it. That's a great point, Jamie, thanks. Right. Bravo, yeah. Good. The The next question is, um, I guess, kind of like this, because actually, as we as we started talking as a group, and when David, when we talked to you when this kind of all started, you know, we talked around this question quite a bit, or not around it, but about it is, and the question is around, how do we, how do we shift from the focus of crisis management to learning lessons and finding new and better ways? How do we make that shift of being in a crisis and, um, actually, I guess, functioning more normally 
and not in necessarily crisis mode? Well, I, I think that's that's a great question, and I don't think it's got a lot of great answers, uh, particularly starting with how we define a crisis. I mean, we we at healthcare we've got this huge influx of patients now. That's definitely not something that they're used to doing every day. But in the same vein, we got folks who are sitting at home because there's nothing to do. And for them, that's a crisis. They got no money coming in. Oh my God, that's a crisis. So we're all going to respond a little bit differently to what we think crisis is. And fortunately, I think I think we're past that shock and awe part of this. And now we're having a big debate about when we're going back to work and all these different things going on and all this different mes these messages being passed around. And I just want to let people stop, take a breath. Look at what you're doing. Look at how you're working. What are you doing differently? Is it better? Do we want to keep doing this? And just be mindful of how you're reacting and how you're driving the train and how you're asking questions and how you're thinking about the information that you receive. Um, that mindfulness approach will allow that, that crisis kind of to settle enough for us to be able to see what's at the end and, and then start thinking about now that I can see, I've got a little bit of a picture of a light at the tunnel. Now I got to figure out how to get from where I am to that end point and start making a plan to get there. And if we don't have a plan to get there, when everything lifts, are we just going to rush back into this and go right back? Or are we going to be mindful about future precautions and keeping the workplace safe or the workforce safe? Um, I think we have a lot of things to continue to think about. Yeah, I'd yeah, like to add to that too. Okay, oh, go, go, Jamie. Just so, so on that point of uh, you know, sort of the different levels of crisis, right? Uh, people are experiencing it different ways. You know, if the worst thing I have to do is work from home, um, I, I, I don't define that as a crisis. Um, even if even if I generally make most of my money by hopping on an airplane to visit clients, so so it's it's uh, it really depends on the severity. And and there's there's companies that are in businesses from you know event management, uh, sports management. These are these are shut down and maybe for a while, right? Yeah. That, that's a crisis, right? Um, others that are you know healthcare institutions, they they are experiencing their own crisis. So a lot it was really just getting through the adjustment, and it was chaotic and messy, and they still have a lot of instability. But as more and more stabilizes. You kind of have to shift your 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 mode and know where your where your shift is from kind of averting crisis or pivoting away from crisis to trying to trying to adjust. And I think the more um, d discreetly you can make that switch from crisis management, crisis aversion to to sort of planning and forward movement, then the the, the more focused you can be in making the switch. Yeah, and what I was going to add to the mix is that, you know, we see a lot in organizations where there are groups, teams, individuals, um, all levels that have a bit of an addiction to adrenaline and the adrenaline rush that crises generates. And being thoughtful and being aware when you're in the presence of that can be the first step, like breaking any habit is the first step is awareness. And so, you know, it might be worth taking a very good look and you can do it virtually as well as, you know, in person at who seems to get juiced up by crises and who doesn't like it and how you can trade that juice of stability, predictability, consistency for that juice of adrenaline, uh, that adrenaline rush that chaos gives people. Um, it's not an easy transition, but, but start by being aware of and and work to to have the candid conversations to turn that juice from the juice of adrenaline to the juice of stability good um the next question and one thing i will say about the questions is we go through these questions you may know even though we try to categorize them um, a little bit there's certainly some overlap as as we went through them as well but this next question is a little more granular um some, there's several people asked how does a, a um, basically continuous improvement leader help their organization um, to sh make this shift to, to changing the way they think with their heart and mind, in a sense? What's their role in that? I'm going to defer to Karen. Yeah, 
You know, to me, everything starts with conversation and understanding where people are coming from. And, you know, it, it really depends on what gap you're trying to close and what is it that is happening or being said or, or behavior that you would like to see shifted and, and then what's the root cause of that and then how do you close the gap? You know, it all, it's like classic problem solving. Um, so it's, I think it's a bit situational based on the kind of situation. Um, I don't know, I, I, think, I think I'd like to toss the ball to Jamie or, or David <laughs> on this one. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. I, I, you know, I, I do, I do agree. It's very situational. It depends on, you know, where the business is and their, their crisis management and things like that. But, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of improvement is, you know, you have stability, it broke, you're trying to fix it and then maybe notch it up again. Well, a lot of things broke, right. And you're not even trying to get it back because you can't, right. You can't get it back to normal because the, the disruptor is still in place. So to me, it still comes back to focusing on purpose, right? It's just harder to find the purpose of what you're trying to accomplish uh, because of the disruption. But you come back to what are you really trying to do? What problem are you trying to solve? What do you want this meeting to do? Why are you having this event? Whatever it is, really go back to the why, go back to the purpose and start and build back out from there. And if you can get people connected to purpose in their actions, then they're more open. Then it's then you can get more into tactics and how to and all the different ways you can help them go forward. But if they aren't connected to purpose around why they're trying to do something or make a change or fix something, then you're really trying to jam stuff that doesn't feel uh, congruent with what they're experiencing right now. And I think a, a great role for continuous improvement professionals in the current state is to provide all the support and comfort and advice that they can to their leaders who are making the plans and making the decisions to come back facilitate those good discussions ask those good questions help them to find that gap that both of you have mentioned and then provide uh, the coaching and support and the connection that they need to get the word out so we can actually make some progress okay good Actually, with that, I think that was maybe somewhat of a good transitional question. We're going to go kind of roll into our next, you know, it's the way we categorized things um, kind of around personal kind of work habits, things associated with that. So the first question for the group um, is of within this uh, new work model or that's going on, what, what, or what new work models do you see emerging from our current reality, our current situation? I think the, the biggest that I, I think, uh, I hope will emerge is more distributed ownership. Call it empowerment, um, call it a lot of things, but you know, you, you can't, uh, there's a lot of things you can't do in large groups. You can't put your fingers on every part of the organization in the same way. You're kind of having to trust and delegate and empower uh, to your teams in this sort of largely work, working remote environment. Um, and, and you can't you can't go and touch everything yourself. So no matter how many hours and how much energy you have. So I, I think we're seeing more distributed ownership of decisions and tasks and direction. And, and I, I hope we kind of learn from that um, and, and carry that forward. Ultimately, you know, all speaking as lean folks, that's what we're trying to build anyway. And if this becomes a forcing function that helps to drive more of that uh, and, and more leaders learn to uh, trust, effectively delegate, make sure there's clear processes so that they can, then that's, that's a great shift that I, I do hope comes out of it on a more permanent basis. I'd like to mention something that I've been thinking a lot about lately about work models and it's the kind of the opposite of I think what the question was asking is like how do we, what, what are the work models going to change? I'd like to raise a red flag on what work models should not change. Yeah. And I'm a little concerned that everyone's getting so, you know, comfortable now with virtual work that we're going to swing way too far the other direction and think that everything can be done virtually and everything is, you know, easy to do by technology and everything uh, that, you know, I don't want us to lose the human element of having candid conversations. Difficult conversations are very difficult to do on a webcam. Uh, they can be done. They are done. They are being done. 
but you know, there's just the, the human connection and reading body language is much more difficult on a webcam than it is in person. And people act on camera. When you get people in a room, they relax into themselves a little more easily and quickly. So especially if you're leading improvement, and especially if it's a tough improvement, you know, you have to be really careful that you're reading everything you possibly can from a webcam. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot more work reading, reading from a webcam than it is in person. So I just don't want us to go 180 the, the other direction um, and then find that nice balance with virtual work and in-person work, eyeball to eyeball. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Karen. We, we do as humans have this need for, for this tight human connection. With, we've got our families and we're still in tight connection with them, largely speaking. But we as humans have a, a bona fide need for a, a community to be around as well and to have that that face to face, that community. Um, that said, um, we have proven now that we can still get results working remotely yeah. when we may not have been able to before. Um, so there's going to be a, a hard argument being made to say, no, 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 you have to just be in the office. and We've got to we got to learn how to just quit trading time. Um, when we need to be together, when we need to be face to face, by God, we need to do that. We need to create the time for that. But I don't want to, I don't want people to just say, hey, you got to be in the office just to for your hours. You got to log the hours in the office. Right. So the leaders need to make right. the plans for what the outcomes and the objectives and the results need to be. We need to share those plans, and then we need to turn loose. We need to let go and let people do that, back to Jamie's point about the empowerment. They've demonstrated that they can do this without us standing over them. Well, let's let them do it. So I think- we Standards. Made some yeah, <laughs> have the standards. We need standards. When, the standards. What's the standard for when, what do you do in the office? What do you do virtually? You know, what are the standards? Yeah I, I, yeah, I think that's an important decision point. And how are you gonna measure the performance of the work? Uh, and, and we can do that remotely as well, but again, there's, there's, it's hard to beat that that nice tactile team huddle. Everybody bringing in the same space, looking at the same things, mm -hmm. developing the plan for the day. It's hard to beat that, but uh, it's not the only way to work. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Actually, I did something I could certainly relate to. Not that uh, me and my team were working remotely, and we certainly get things done. But when we're in the office together, you can have those instant conversations very quick. The feedback loop becomes much more efficient and effective. It mm -hmm. helps out, let alone like just the inner, the human interaction. Um, the next question is, um, so what, uh, can you guys talk or discuss or tell about some tools that folks could implement now to help um, lean practitioners, I guess the lean practitioners guide their teams to this new normal, or I guess maybe in the case of what we're doing here, this this better normal. I know you've been, you guys have been working with some organizations and folks virtually as well. So we maybe have some experience you're going through right now with it. Well, I'm wondering if people are finding it easier or more difficult to uh, use a simple tool like a huddle and a, and a visual management board, that team information board. Uh, are they finding that? Diff more difficult to do uh, in this remote environment, or is it easier to actually connect more with this remote environment? Uh, the immediate assumption is, oh my God, everybody's scattered all over the place. How am I as a leader gonna kind of keep track of things and, and maintain my sense of control and sanity and make sure people are still doing the things that they need to do? Um, so we're discovering these new ways to work. I, I want people to be able to share what kinds of new things are working for them, um, how have they digitize their uh, team information board so that they can still share the performance metrics that mean something to people. Um, I think there's plenty of room for discovery, but we need to be sharing this stuff as well. Karen, you got some folks that are doing something specific. Uh, is there any, so any tricks that they've learned that, that you can share? 
Yeah. So of all of our clients, the ones that have internal improvement teams are all healthcare. And so we, we've stopped all improvement projects for right now because it, most of them are testing centers and they're very busy. For those that aren't, we've been working at the leadership level. So we're not at the, at the practitioner level right now. Um, well, we hope they will become practitioners. Um, and so the, it's a little different because it's more conversational and decisions, but I did, and I know this was a question that was asked too, we did just have our first um, value stream transformation overview and followed by a current state mapping activity with a, a leadership team that went shockingly well. Like I was, I had never done it virtually and I was like, oh, I don't know how this is gonna go. I never met them. It's a brand new client. I've never seen them face to face. So I'm getting to know them virtually and um, it went really well. So I. You know, I think as a facilitator, I can say one thing that would be helpful for anyone that's facilitating is that, you know, it's just a matter of asking the, you know, the same right questions to get people to open up. And we're doing a little more with data than we did before because of it being a virtual environment. Um, we're not walking the Gemba, although one of the guys is actually in the office. And so he did actually do a video of something that we needed to see. So we did get that. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I'm being helpful right now. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to pass the baton. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, take it a, a step up in just sort of categories of tools because I, I, I think it's less around here's the best tool to use and the best method. But, but I'll say there's sort of three things that I, I think from a, from a method standpoint are really helpful for teams. One, experiment. You know, experiment like with everything right because we've disrupted cause and effect we've disrupted our systems even just what time of day is a good time to have a team meeting if you have two team members who have young kids and at eight o'clock they're trying to get their kids started on the homeschool on the computer that's probably a bad time for a team meeting even if that's always when you had it so so experiment test iterate uh is one rapidly turn what works into new standards you know even if it's just you know, how do we determine new talks next in a meeting, right? Whatever it is, just develop new standards for the little things that help. And then try to drive waste out of anything you can, right? So some of it's happening naturally uh, with this sort of interruption. But, but um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are finding a lot of this work harder. And so, uh, you know, just drive micro waste out of your personal routine, out of your team's routine. Focus on what's really most important, and if you if you focus on those three things, I think a lot of you can find a lot of things that will end up making the team more effective. Yeah, good point. Um, I, I think we've been hammering people for decades to go to the gimba, go to the gimba, go to the gimba, go to the gimba, right? Um, so now you can't go to the gimba, but that doesn't mean you can't still do these kinds of things. Uh, it just means we've got to get to a point. Uh, we can experiment. We don't have to be in the gimba doing a physical experiment. We can experiment by by doing a collective brainstorming activity and just kind of a, have a mind storm session about what might work or what might not work about these assumptions and this um, countermeasure. And you can build all those plans and then you've got kind of the foundation for when you go back to work, here are the things we've got to put in place so we get into this implementation cycle and that's what makes us return to better. Make those plans, plan to implement, implement hard when we get back, and then we'll be better off. Okay, good. So I'm gonna add one more thing that you guys, you guys just triggered, if you don't mind. Uh, we, you know, we were at a client right before the lockdown and did a, a gamble walk, and it was a non-manufacturing, non-physical, like all data, everything in the computer. And you know, I debated whether or not we were gonna walk the gam walk the value stream at all or not because we had so much involvement from the different functional areas up front that I thought, eh, I'm not sure it's gonna be very helpful. Wow, I am so glad that, that, that we said, yes, let's go ahead and walk the, walk the value stream. Um, just talking with all the people that play the functional role that weren't on the, the mapping team because they were frontline workers, the leadership got so much more aware of the obstacles that they face, the barriers to the processes they're trying to do, and, and we would never have achieved that. I think you can achieve the same thing virtually. It's getting the right people in the conversation 
so that people can learn, leaders especially can learn what the reality is of the process and how it's working and things like that, or the value stream. Um, so I think um, it's it's not impossible. We just have to peg the right people to have the conversations with so that leaders get a cross-functional perspective. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Actually, great answer, Karen, because that just that's what a great uh, segue type uh, answer to kind of the next category we were kind of we we're rolling into as we were going through the questions is is teamwork and kind of one of the first questions um, somebody uh, had asked about that was so how do we go to the Gimba virtually? Well, I'll, I'll kick off. I mean, it's it literally is identifying you know who you need to talk about and what you need to see. Now, for an organization that's still operating and there are people in the office, you know, video cameras are beautiful. Um, you can do lots of videotaping. For a hundred percent remote workforce now, it's interviewing people and and learning about the work, learning what their experience is, learning what their you know frustrations are. Um, I always say that the minute that you know someone's frustrated, there's waste. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to be frustrated without being in the presence of waste. And so um, it can be done. You just have to you know get them on a Zoom call or whatever it might be and ask them the questions that you want to understand about the current state. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to. Uh, I'll go two different directions. One is. You know, back when we used to have, you know, 24 hour changeover times for a massive press, I mean, we'd set up a video recorder, let it record the whole thing and, and do some of it on fast forward and slow-mo. And, and, you know, we, we, we did direct observation 20, 30 years ago with video. Um, and so I think there's a lot that can be done in that way. The other thing, returning to my point about more distributed ownership and and uh, leadership is is what I would sort of term surrogate direct observation or surrogate uh, go to the Gamba, mm. right? There's not there's a lot of places where uh, distributed work in general we can't always go to the Gamba uh, physically. So teaching someone who is at the Gamba how to observe and then trusting their eyes in, to be able to communicate back with you. Is I think a wonderful development opportunity. If if you were mm -hmm. forced into it, great. Develop a bunch of people to be your surrogate eyes and filters to see what you wanted to see, and uh, maybe some other good comes out of that as well. Yeah, we've got to walk that line between um, empowering and abandoning too, because I can see the temptation yeah. for folks. Oh my God, I can't get out there as often. So yeah, y'all just do your thing. Uh, we as leaders still have an obligation to provide all the support and encouragement, the correction and the new challenges for everybody virtually as well. So your Gimba might change to, I'm sitting in my office, but I'm talking to four people around the country. Let me get on there and, and define my interval. So we're going to adopt this idea of short interval leadership. I'm going to come around. I'm going to come around frequently, but I'm not coming around to micromanage and tell you how to do your job. I'm coming around to make sure you've got everything you need to succeed. And then we're going to touch base and we're going to go on. And you should have been doing that in your regular workplace. You ought to be doing it now by different communication means. Um, you've still got to get out to the Gimba. Your Gimba has just changed a little bit now. And the things that we learn now about connecting with folks and about asking the right questions and about keeping them on track and providing the support they need instead of being directive and micromanaging, you need to keep that going back. People are effective when you let go. Yeah, with that, that actually but is a good... One, one, can I just say one corollary of letting go is making sure that it's smart letting go and not abdicating all responsibility as a leader. Um, there's a fine line there. Absolutely. Yeah, with that, it kind of relates kind of the next questions. There's a series of questions people had around this is in this particular our current circumstance um, and taking a look at uh, people like in uh, supervisory roles, frontline um, supervisors and so forth, where we can't necessarily have these daily huddles, daily meetings, you know, particularly like the physicality of it. Um, how do we compensate for that? What do we do in order to kind of maintain that, uh, um, I guess that function, but yet in our current circumstance? I, I would argue that well, it's more than the huddle every day, huddle every day, 
um, because you're you're trying to work every day, right? Um, so in the huddle, the, the purpose of a huddle in any kind of environment is to call the play, whether it's the, the next play on a football team or whether it's the play for the day. Um, I think we need to be touching base uh, every day. If you don't measure things that frequently, maybe you need to look at what you're measuring. Karen? Yeah, I was going to say, um, so we're 100% virtual. We've been virtual from day one of TKMG. Um, and so we huddle virtually every single day. And um, it's it has been no different. So, you know, it, it, the situation hasn't affected us. And, you know, the huddle, it, I don't really even, in some ways, I don't really even understand what's really behind the question when people ask, you know, how do I huddle virtually? because it's it's about conversations you know it's about relaying important information learning what obstacles people are dealing with and then you know figuring out how you help remove those obstacles or those barriers so i i it might be more of a mental block that we have about doing virtual huddles than necessary i'd be curious to see what what people are struggling with like what are the real um yeah. problems that they're having with huddling virtually and i, I would i would uh perhaps assume and i might be ex extrapolating too much is that some of the people that are having a harder time with that uh it is um uh, based on kind of evolving the huddle to be more than it should be um doing what i call the christmas tree meeting right we the huddle is the christmas tree and then we hang a whole bunch of other stuff on it and all of a sudden it is all the things that our team uses to operate and that's, that's not what a huddle is, right? A huddle has a specific purpose. And so I think it's, you know, it's probably a good opportunity to declutter the, the huddle and figure out, well, these are things that we could have done on a, on a Trello board or a, um, an and on, it was an and, this was supposed to be an and on poll, but we just batch all our and on polls into the, into the huddle and all these other things that we've, we've kind of lumped into the huddle uh maybe it's time to declutter it and and figure out what doesn't belong there if 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 that's how it has evolved yeah set it mm -hmm. set a hard timeline i mean we're not going to spend how lot to be seven to 15 minutes right let's say let's let's set right. a goal this week we're not, we're not going to go longer than 10 minutes and what's the value that we have to hit all the rest is waste we don't want to do that right so uh, i'm a big fan I love that of that <laughs> It is awesome. And a lot of people think, oh, well, we're doing huddles, so that means we're lean, right? I can see it so that we're doing lean stuff. And it's like, there's a big difference between being lean and doing lean stuff. You know, have that huddle, build those relationships, <laughs> touch base, walk around, even though you can't be there, uh, be there face to face, wherever you can. Um, smartphones are a great invention, allow us to do this kind of call. Um, one of these days, we'll get to the, the, to the two way wrist TV like Dick Tracy. And we can do it on our wristwatch. So <laughs> for I, I can see that there's probably going to be some some pushback. It's, well, not everybody's got a computer, or not everybody's got this. And it's like, well, leaders need to find out what people need, and let's let's provide what people need to make sure we can huddle more effectively and and just stay connected. Just stay connected. You can't get everything done in the huddle, so maybe you got to go back and have a one-on-one -on -one later that day. Maybe once a week you have a group session where you just have a you know. It's just a bitch session, right? Let everybody just vent everything <laughs> that they've been going through. And all of this is just to stabilize those relationships, build those relationships for, for, for the future. We want, we want to take care of our people. And this is how we show that we're taking care of our people by staying connected. Good. Another question, which I think you're in a way answering with these, with your comments right now was, um, so I mentioned they have a team that's very highly capable and, uh, and does have the capacity to work remotely. What are some of the techniques in keeping that team, keeping that cohesiveness and doing that, which it sounds like you're doing? Is there any other other things you could elaborate on further um, in that regard? Yeah, I've got an idea. Um, a lot of a lot of folks have turned to online learning opportunities, right? And uh, so I, I'm I'm having this discussion with my kids. <laughs> One of them's a uh, he's at OSU. He's in his last semester. He's been COVID quarantined for all of his final classes and all of his final exams, even his graduation is virtual, right? So he's, he's kind of bummed about that. So he's got a different way of, of, of thinking about uh, how, we're gonna, how we're gonna step forward and make this more effective. Um, my other kids, um, my, my daughter has, uh, 
she she's got a job where she's been mostly virtual the whole time kind of like karen but she's got like goes into the office one day a week uh and she's her her schedule has been disrupted because the rest of the family is at home now um and so she's learning new techniques on on, on uh, managing her own schedule and working around the, the crying babies and the, the kids who need the attention and the wife who needs more attention as well. Um, and then my, my third child is in Austin, Texas, and he and his fiance are down there and um, he works for a marketing firm and draws real strength when they're together in the office. I mean, because you get that physical connection, there's some energy that you still can get. Uh, but he says since they've been quarantined, um, they've had much more of an opportunity to connect with a wider circle now. Um, my son was even telling me they had a they had a virtual beer pong tournament that he was the runner up. He, so he was the runner up. Uh, but if if we can if we can innovate like that, if we can create these kinds of, of virtual interactions, what can we do with teams? Um, can we do virtual team building activities? Um, can we jointly go into online learning? When my son had to face the online learning for the end of the semester, his eyes roll back in his head. And you can ask anybody who's done mandatory or compliance online training. It is not a treat. It is a painful process. Nobody wants to do it. You just do it to click the blocks. So there are some wonderful online learning platforms out there. But let's set a goal as leaders. Let's say, all right, let's as a team, we're going to go through module ABC of this particular thing. And then we're going to meet together. And we're going to spend an hour talking about what we learned in that. So we go through that learning experience in a small chunk and then have a more meaningful experience where the, the group talks together. I think that'll be a great start to building that team more because you're focused on learning, not just work, but you want to be able to tie it together so it's more purposeful and meaningful. Okay, just a good. couple of thoughts. All right. Well, uh, this 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 will be the last question. We're just down on the stretch here with our time and everything. Um, but with this is um, several people ask things around this is how can you effectively run a value stream mapping workshop online or virtually in this environment? Uh, I'll start. I'm in the middle of one, and um, it's not, you know, three three days like you do in person. It's actually broken into two to three hour segments with breaks and homework and stuff like that. Um, what I'm doing is, because the client's never done value stream work, and this is all very new to them, is I'm actually controlling the screen, and I'm just using PowerPoint to draw blocks and draw arrows between them as they're, you know, mapping they're you know basically talking about the value stream and we had data um pulled up front um to start putting in some of the things like lead time and process time or cycle time and um you know i asked the questions just like i would if i was in person the only thing that i find that's really missing and i and it's it, it does concern me is there's that tactile you know kinesthetic learners like to touch things and see movement and and all that and um you know it's someone that's online is like a little distant from the actual work but you know you can keep them really engaged by asking questions and laughing and you know having some fun with it and and still getting the work done um and then i'm going to convert it into the software that we use um, which is like graphics flow charter for the actual deliverable to the client and it's so far working really well there are only four leaders in this particular team it's a it's a pretty small to mid-sized company. So it's a smaller team. So I'm not sure I would attempt um, online mapping with the normal team size we get is eight, nine, and 10. I might try to go more of the six to eight realm uh, max, just because I think it's harder for people to get a word in when there's more people. Does that affect Even the if, scope of the value stream map itself, Karen? Should they, should they limit the scope maybe while we're virtual? I, I haven't. I mean, I, I I think you know the, the improvement needs the improvement needs the improvement need. Uh, the gaps, the gap, the gap. Uh, so I haven't changed the scope at all. Good. I think there's a, a couple you know things we can continue to experiment with technology where you use a multi um, a, a multi technology standpoint, right? Do some things offline where they can process some information input some opinions or answers or data into you know spreadsheets or surveys and then coalesce as a team 
So you can you can kind of engage people in in a, in a range of different things. There's tools like Miro where everybody can collaborate in the same space at the same time. Uh, that requires you know learning and experimentation in its own right. The other thing I'd say is, and this is less about value stream mapping, but just sort of other big improvements is find ways to break it down where you can. Not not to limit the scope, but to to, to break down the problem, break down the uh, the project. So you don't have a 25 person team, you have five five person teams. And then it's much easier to collaborate online with, with smaller teams. And a lot of, you know, for a lot of projects, we need to be, you know, breaking them down better anyway. Uh, so it's probably a, a, a good focusing opportunity. So I think there's, you know, we do need to think about the way people engage Again, experiment, try new things, and make sure it fits with that particular team. Yeah, I'm really glad yeah, you guys were able to make this. This has been great. Yeah, ahead, one more quick thing is a very tactical thing is that, you know, with most of the online, you know, communication tools like Zoom, you can give control, mouse control to the other person. So, for example, there was something they were trying to describe to me and I couldn't figure out exactly how they were describing it to make it visual. So I just gave the mouse control, say, hey, move the blocks around. So they, you know, so it was them engaging with the map and, and they, they moved them around. I'm like, oh, OK, now I get it. You know, so it's you can definitely have it be interactive. It doesn't have to be just one way. That is the coolest thing ever. Okay, great. All right, well, we've hit our target time. So um, thank you everyone who joined us. Um, thank you to our panel, Karen, Jamie, and David. And with this, we hope we um, gave you some things to think about and things to do that will get you not again, back, not back to normal, but back to better, which is where we want everybody to be. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everybody.